Welcome to Koshi, the show that every single day celebrates the men and women who make coastal Mississippi such a great place to live, work, and play. And look, one of the people who has really helped make this such a great place is Jeff Duncan from NOLA.com and the Times-Picayune. Uh, Jeff has been with us every Friday for a couple of years. He had a little break, and I'll explain to you in just a second about the break he just took. But uh, but he's the lead columnist. He's the star of the NOLA.com Times-Picayune team. He's a, a racehorse and expert, a golf expert. He d- dabbles in, in uh, college football, but man, more than anything, he is uh, a Saints expert, and he's written the book on the Saints. So without any further ado, let me bring my friend Jeff Duncan back into the conversation. And just first of all, after a two or three week break, welcome back, my friend. Ricky, it's good to be back, man. It's it's upon us. Football season's here with the first it, practice. It, it's it is. And look, I've been really looking forward to this conversation today because people who follow you at NOLA.com, if they don't, I would really urge you to go to NOLA.com and sign up for the Saints newsletter. You will be very glad you did. You did. It, it drops into your inbox and you can get coverage from a team of, of reporters and columnists that no one can match. I mean, what, what they're doing, their years of service, what they do to, by the way, I should also say their, their years of connections, what they do to cover the saints is incredible and uh, I, I look forward to that newsletter every morning i really urge you to go to nola.com uh, and sign up for the saints newsletter again you'll be happy you did and you'll get to know jeff duncan better for people who follow jeff duncan you know that he's had a really interesting week of writing and i have several phrases that we'll pull out along the way jeff but before we get to the saints you're actually writing the definitive book on steve gleason's life and that's what you've been working on the last couple of weeks tell me about that yeah, look, uh, we're just getting started in the writing process, Ricky, and we're very excited. I mean, uh, it's about a year-long project, a little, a little longer than a year. we got to turn the, the manuscript in next June. Uh, it's with Knopf Agency out of uh, the random Penguin Random House uh, line of books, and um, we're ecstatic. The gold standard. Let me just say, the gold standard. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're as good as it gets, so we're blessed to be with them and very excited, great people to work with. And look, Steve's, uh, you know, an amazing human being. Of all the people I've covered in my career, I've never met anybody as um, more uh, impressive than Steve Lee and what he's doing with his life, how he's affecting other people. Right now, good example, he and his family are up in the Pacific Northwest leading one of their Team Gleason adventures, like uh, what they do for others that have ALS. They sponsor these adventures, give them something to do with their life, give them purpose. Uh, he's reached so many people, so many more people in his journey with ALS than he did as a football player. And that's that's pretty amazing. It is a it's sort of the ultimate story of becoming the best version of yourself, even in the in the midst of ALS. Steve has he has strove hard, actually. To be the best version of himself and make a make a commitment back to humanity, it's incredible that story. And I, man, I'm I'm really, really um, so so uh, happy for you. To to I know you and Steve go back a long way, so it was natural that you two would collaborate on this book. But uh, once again, for people who don't know, this is not a book about ALS. It's a book about living, isn't it? Right. Yeah. It's a book about uh, how you deal with adversity, how you find purpose in life, and set priorities. I mean, Steve's now in year, coming up on year 12 with ALS, which is a, really an, a terminal disease, Ricky, that, that most people only survive two to three years, uh, the longest five years. So it's remarkable. Uh, his will to live, I think it's a testament to the human spirit. And we write a lot about uh, how he keeps going and, and why yeah. he keeps going. And I think yeah. those, those two lessons you can apply to everyday life, you know, why yeah. and how you deal with whatever adversity comes in your life. For Steve and Michelle, it's ALS. For other people, it's different reasons. But I think there's some life lessons there in this book. It's incredible. For for coastal Mississippians, um, Anthony Tapazzi, the former president of Mississippi Power Company, someone I worked extremely closely with after Hurricane Katrina. Obviously, we knew each other before the storm, but he was a, he was a really defining leader after Hurricane Katrina. He died of ALS. And it was just so hard to, to watch uh, him decline. Mine was sharp to the end, but it was just a difficult battle for him. Okay, so let's shift gears. It's exciting finally to get started. We get to find out what, you know, if all our you know, growing expectations will become what we hope it will become. 
Yeah, there's, you know, I wrote about that this week in my column. The expectations are so across the board on this team. Uh, they vary wildly from across the country. I think outside of the Gulf Coast, uh, most people are skeptical of the Saints. You got a, a new first-year head coach, and Dennis Allen, who didn't have success in his first go-round. Jameis Winston, of course, has had a checkered career at quarterback and is coming off a major injury. Uh, so there's skepticism nationally, but locally, Ricky, I mean, it's off the charts right now. This feels like Drew Brees, uh, you know, era in his prime. Uh, how excited people are about this team. So I think it's interesting to see the divergent expectations on this team. And I can tell you, look, internally, uh, the Saints are very confident. They, they think they are sitting on a very good season. And um, so far, uh, you know, it's been pretty impressive what we've seen so far. Well, we'll talk about the first day and how Jameis looked and all these players coming back from injury and the hoopla around Thomas and all that. But you wrote a great column for, uh, about the Saints, their importance to the city, really their importance to the entire Gulf South. But you said, you, you closed it by saying this, one thing is certain, no city in America needs something to rally around more than New Orleans right now. Another Saints season like 2021 and the entire city will be in a sackcloth and ashes this fall. <laughs> But yeah. it's true. I mean, the, the city's really, man, between crime and, you know, the a struggling leadership. And, I mean, the city's really had some difficult times. And they need the Saints in, you know, in this pinnacle moment to help them, don't they? Yeah, well, look, the Saints, you know this, Ricky. I mean, the Saints are kind of our psychological barometer or divining rod, right? I mean, we, uh, we follow our, our psyches, follow how the Saints perform on, on each weekend. And, and more so than most cities in America, it's really, it goes beyond a, just a sports team relationship with the city. It's almost symbiotic. And um, the, because things have not been going well here, I mean, the leadership has been, uh, you know, we've been under, uh, has been cr criticized roundly recently. We are on a, a crime wave, you know, inflation is up. Uh, there's just a lot of things that I think are weighing on people's minds. So we look to sports for an escape, and, and more so than ever, uh, the Saints' importance, I think, um, in this city for people to find that escape from everyday life, because it's not easy here right now. Uh, I think there's a, there's a burden there. And look, I asked Dennis Allen about it at his pre-training camp press conference, and he admitted, he said, look, being the head coach of the New Orleans Saints is not like other places. It's different here. And he accepts that burden and responsibility and welcomes it and appreciates it. So I think that was a very interesting insight from him early on in his tenure. Yeah, I watched the entire press conference, and I thought he did a terrific job. There's a little bit of Sean Payton in the way that he answers mm -hmm. questions and whatever, and he's coy in certain respects. But at the same time, he's available to you guys, and I think it's important. Just one other comment about the city. I read this morning where the mayor is headed to, I guess, Singapore uh, yeah. for, to give a speech the third time out of the country in five weeks. That's not going to go well for her. No, I think we, the local media has been all over that. I think she's around eighty thousand dollars in travel expenses because you know that you know this Ricky. I mean, when the mayor leaves on a trip like that, it's not just the mayor; it's a, it's a contingent of people. So it gets expensive on the taxpayer dollars, and you wonder about the return on that investment right now. Okay, so look, we'll start this here, and then we'll pick it up on the other side. We're getting near the end, but let me let's let's start with really one of the more important. I mean, actually, there's so many different headlines. By the way, I mean, you know that, and all of them really center around players coming back from in injury. But Michael Thomas has to be one of the most uh, convert, you know, uh, discussed players currently. You wrote a great piece, and you ended it with this. Thomas, the, excuse me, the, the, the windmills don't stand a chance. The windmills don't stand a chance. Now, for someone who didn't read your story, won't have any idea what you're talking about. But explain, explain to our listeners what you meant by that and, and sort of your, your observations on this first time back from the physically unable to perform list. Well, it was a literary reference. Maybe not a good one. I don't know, Ricky. To, look, we all remember Don Quixote and Sancho Panza tilting at windmills and the figurative uh, reference there of you know, finding an enemy in life to give you motivation. And I think Mike Thomas, that's always been sort of his mentality. Uh, he loves to be uh, have a chip on his shoulder. That's what's driven him 
uh, from a guy that really, he was the 756th ranked high school prospect coming out of high school and ended up getting a, being a second round draft pick and then going to the NFL after five other receivers got drafted ahead of him and becoming the best in that class and one of the best in the league. So there's a, there's a motivational drive and competitive drive that he has, and uh, he loves it. He finds these windmills to joust, and that's what gives him the drive to become great. And uh, I think this, this past injury is giving him a lot of motivational fuel, and he certainly looked uh, ready to play out there in his first practice back uh, on Wednesday. Well, we'll talk more about Michael Thomas when we come back from break. We'll we'll get we'll get uh, Jeff's observations about Jameis Winston, uh, Taysom Hill's coming back off injury. I mean, it's, there's a lot to talk about. When we come back on the other side, we'll finish our conversation about Thomas, and we'll move on from there. See you after this break. Welcome back to Kofi. I'm thrilled to have my friend Jeff Duncan who I had the, the real honor of working with when I was over in New Orleans. He's the star of the NOLA.com Times Picayune sports team. And uh, you know, he's a Saints expert. There's no very few people would question that. He wrote literally wrote the book on Drew Brees and Sean Payton. And he's written other books about the Saints as well. Hey, coming back to Thomas for a second. You know, this whole jousting with Windmill's uh, uh, phraseology, I think it's a good way to describe him. When, when you guys were, were having uh, sort of the media conversation with him, really the first time you guys have had a good, good whack at him in a couple of years, um, or nearly two years, he man. He, first of all, he doesn't want to talk about the injury. He's he, he's really in the moment, and he and he's all about what you know. I, I'm going to prove to you through my actions that I'm ready. You know, didn't you like what you saw? Essentially, you know. But I love that chip on his shoulder, buddy. Yeah, that, that's exa- he reminds me in a lot of ways of Sean Payton. I mean, early young Sean Payton. That's the way he was. He was always trying to find some way, some kind of motivation. And whether that was the media, whether it was the opponent, whether it was somebody internally in the building, uh, Sean Payton was always uh, looking for that chip. And uh, that's the way Mike Thomas is. That's the, that's what's driven him to the top of his profession. He's an intense guy. He certainly cares about his craft. And uh, it's what's made him great. It's why, why he's gotten to where he's gotten. So that's part of the personality. And that's when you have a football team made up of 50, 60 players, they're all going to have different personalities. And he is certainly a, a very intense guy that I think coaches have to treat differently than the other players in the building. And I think it said a lot when Dennis Allen flew out to California earlier this year to meet with Mike Thomas. So he didn't do that with everybody else on the roster because he knows he's a very particular guy. He's a, he's a perfectionist and a unique personality. And they need him not only to be great as a player, but he needs to become a leader in his position group. And I think he's embracing that as well. And that's something he had never done before. Well, you can't. Okay, so we had 11 on 11. As you, I think you or someone described it as kind of playing on the cloud. They're not hitting, right. but they're moving fast. And you're getting the opportunity to begin to look at the chemistry between Jameis Winston and his receivers. And particularly, you got to see, you know, where's Mike, Michael Thomas in relation to Jameis Winston. And what he had to say about Jameis Winston was incredibly complimentary. You can, you can see that there's some evolving positive chemistry between the two of them already, can't you? Yeah, yeah good, good point. I mean, you can see. Jameis Winston knows what Mike Thomas can do. I mean, any, he's a quarterback's best friend. I mean, he doesn't drop anything. His hands are incredible. And so on third down, tight situations, red zone, uh, Mike Thomas is going to be the security blanket for Jameis Winston. Now they've just got to get on the same page. He's got to learn the body language, uh, how he likes to make his cuts, all those little nuances that uh, you, know, you have to have at the NFL level at this high level of competition. Uh, we're seeing the same thing with Jarvis Landry. I mean, they haven't, relatively speaking, Jameis Winston has not spent much time with any of these top three receivers, Thomas, Landry, or Chris Olave. And those are going to be the three guys. And uh, so they got time on tasks. And that's why every one of these practices, every rep is going to be important for those guys. Yeah, player, you mentioned those receiver groups. A player we don't talk about often uh, is uh, Troutman. Troutman had a good good day yesterday, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he looked good. I mean, he's also coming off an off-season surgery. Uh, you know, Taysom Hill looked terrific. I mean, I, I hadn't seen Taysom Hill all off-season. Uh, so guys like Troutman, uh, Thomas, 
uh, you know, Winston himself, uh, you know, they're all coming off these significant offseason injuries, and they've been treated very cautiously and conservatively by the staff uh, up until this point, and they're still kind of on a, a pitch count, so to speak. Uh, they're wading in. And this, look, I should point out, this is an NFL mandated, NFL Players Association mandate that you ramp up the physical activity. So Wednesday was very light. It'll be a little more intense on Thursday, a little more intense on Friday. They won't put the pads on until Monday. So it, it's it's all mandated by the league. It's not just Dennis Allen and the Saints. I just want to make that I get it. And one of the, so c- coming to, to Winston, a couple of points. One is, he, sh- he didn't have that gimp that you worried about before. You know, he's continuing to heal. The other thing is he actually brought a group of receivers to Florida, and they did some work together. So it, it, this guy's going to do the work, isn't he? Yeah, and that, look, I think the big the big test is going to come up here in the next week or so when they put the pads on Monday and guys can get up. The, this defense, Ricky, we, we've talked about it before, has the potential to be not only one of the best in the league, but I think one of the best in, in franchise history. Uh, you know, there's elite players all over the board on this defense. What is this offense going to compete? How is it going to compete against this defense once they start engaging in contact? Once the the defensive backs get up on the line of scrimmage and start jamming, that's when I'm going to really zero in on how this team performs and executes, especially the passing game. Because we know the defense, it's proven. Those guys are proven. The offense has a ways to go. And when they line up against Marshawn Lattimore and Cam Jordan, <laughs> And that group, uh, I think, will really have a much better read on how things are going. You're talking about sharpening your capabilities when you have to go against a defense like that. If you can perform well, that would say a lot about this offense. You're 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 you're, you're absolutely right about that. Um, uh, of course, you're not you're not concerned about the defense, but you do have some players coming back from injury. What's the buzz around all that? Well, I mean, you know, one guy was missing, and I'm sure you've read in the headlines, is Tyrae Matthew. He's dealing with a, a family matter, a personal matter. I, I understand he's going to be back on Monday when they put the pads on. Look, Tyrae Matthew is a veteran star player. Uh, these first four days of camp, are, you know, look, I know he's a new player to the system. It'd be great to have him here. Uh, but they need to get that addressed so he, when he comes back, he's focused on the task at hand. Uh, yeah. So he's noticeably missing. Marcus May, though, the other safety, did uh, practice on Wednesday and did look good. I mean, he looked very good coming off of uh, Achilles tendon tear. That's one procedure, Ricky, that has made incredible progress. I mean, it used to be one of the worst injuries you could get was a torn Achilles. Now, it's really not that significant. They've made progress. And actually, right here down the road at LSU, uh, they've uh, come up with a completely new procedure in the last five years to where players can come back in four or five months. That's amazing. Uh, and so he, I think, is gonna, I think that safety position is in good hands with May and Matthew right now. You, you know, hearing you talk, Jeff, and, and knowing that you and I have talked about this for months, and it was the story of the Saints season last year, when you consider the number of, of players that actually played and the number of replacements that had to be dealt with, et cetera, a record in the NFL. But it's so interesting as you talk, as you, as I hear you sort of button up all these different really star players on the team and really detailing as you're talking how many had surgery you know, during the offseason and coming back. Whew, but it's unbelievable, really, when you think about the number of really critical, critical surgeries that have taken place in the past year. And we look. We didn't even talk about Marcus Davenport, who I think's maybe one of the biggest. I mean, the defensive end, it's a big year for him, kind of a contract year. Uh, he's not on the field right now. Uh, Mickey Loomis told us on Tuesday that that's mainly related to conditioning, not to injury. He needs to get into football shape. But I think he's as important a player on the defense as anybody because uh, his potential is off the charts. Cam Jordan talked about it this week. There are very few athletes like him in the league. So I think. Uh, Marcus Davenport will be back probably next week, but he needs a big year, uh, not only for himself, contract-wise, but I think for this defense to kind of go to the next level. Saints are still doing a lot of plotting and scheming to bring in a uh, a running back that can re- really play the game. What's the latest on that? Because I know they've they've there's been lots of maneuvering behind the scenes, but they haven't pulled the trigger on anything yet. What's your, what's your thoughts? Well, they, they actually have. They, they signed Malcolm Brown, who's a, a Mississippi native, actually. Yeah. I, I didn't think that they saw him as that player, though. Well, no. I mean, he's a, he's a solid backup. 
I mean, he's okay. a, he's a, he's a uh, I think he'll compete with Mark Ingram and be one of the two guys that if if Alvin Kamara does face some kind of league league discipline, which I think at this point would be a surprise early in the season. Uh, I think that if it happens this year, it'll be later in the season. Uh, but if it did come down to that, I think they would be fine with Brown and Ingram as a one-two punch. Uh, Malcolm Brown put together a lot of good seasons in in uh, in Los Angeles with the Rams, and uh, he's a quality back. He was hurt last year in Miami. He didn't get on the field much, but we talked to him uh, on Wednesday, and he was very impressive. Now, we'll see what it's like once they put the pads on. That's when you evaluate running backs, when they yeah. start hitting each other in the line. But I think they see him. I think they see him as a as, as equal to Mark Ingram. Oh wow! I didn't I didn't realize. Well, as it relates to Mark Ingram, they also have concerns about him falling off in terms of you look at the look at his stats the last two or three years. Um, you know, this could be a down year for him. You know, how, how when you get I mean, up in age as a running back? Ricky, I mean, in in running backs, that's like a dinosaur. Uh, he's the, he's really the oldest regular running back in the league right now. So it's just reality. Far the time catches up to you. He, he had knee surgery this offseason. So I think that's insurance. Malcolm Brown's insurance for Mark Ingram. So interesting. So interesting. Listen, buddy, have fun at uh, training camp. Uh, have fun getting back in the swing of things. I, it, this is yeah. a fun time of the year for someone like you. And this is where people will start leaning on you more and more because of your sources and your ability to connect. You'll have stories and columns nobody else has even thought of. Um, anyway, it's been great to talk to you. See you next week. Hey, yeah. Look, next week we'll talk. I'll be up in Canton, Ohio, previewing the Pro Football Hall of Fame induction of Sam Mills. So, We'll talk about that a little bit next week. I look forward to it. Oh, awesome. Awesome. This has been Jeff Duncan from NOLA.com and the Times Picayune. We'll see you after this break.